Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Arshind. The region of the Indo-Pacific has a lot which is happening. And there are strategic balances that are going to come up in the region because, of course, our very close friend, China. There is, of course, an Indian impact to this entire game, which is what we're going to discuss with Brigadier Arun Segal, who's here with us, who's also a senior fellow for the strategic and regional security at the Delhi Policy Group. Guys, you can Google him. Some of his writings are insightful. Please just go to Delhi Policy Group, his page, and all his writings are there for you to actually get a lot more insights with regards to what all he writes. Sir, first of all, thank you so much. And hello and welcome to the show. My pleasure, sir. It was, it was an honor to be interviewed by you. Thank you, sir. So let's just give us a, a brief introduction sort of a thing with regards to what's happening in the Indo-Pacific. Of course, we know the Chinese have been getting more and more aggressive. Um, that's something that they also talk about. Uh, nowadays, In the uh, with the recent exercises in Taiwan, uh, there was, of course, a bit of a tension that is, escalates every time there's a, there's a movement in that direction. But generally speaking, sir, what is the power balance like in the Indo-Pacific at the moment? See, essentially speaking, we have to understand is this, that uh, Indo-Pacific as a construct uh, comprises of two oceans, the, the, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, which are joined together with the South China Sea. The linking of the two oceans is done by the South China Sea. The, the western portion or, or what is called the Western Pacific and the Southeastern Asia uh, comprises a dynamic zone where this is where the efficacy of American power is most prominent in terms of American bases in Japan, presence of Seventh Fleet, Japan itself, alliance with Korea, alliance with Japan, alliance with uh, Australia. And now with the coming of the AUKUS, there is a new dynamic which has been created. So this is, and, and to ensure that there is no breakout by China in the Western Indian Pacific, uh, Western uh, Pacific region, there is a first island chain which comprises of on top is Japan, followed by Taiwan, and coming down to Philippines. Uh, th this is a bulwark of the alliance, Western-led alliance system to prevent China from breaking out from its continental uh, construct into the maritime domain. So that's one part of, of the, Indo uh, uh, the Pacific part. The Indo-Pacific is the Indian Ocean, vast seas of Indian Ocean, which extends from the east coast of Africa to, to the Malaccas and going straight up to Australia. People don't sometimes understand that Australia is part, the Western Australia, the Southwestern Australia is straddling the Indian Ocean. In fact, there is a place called Stalinger, where there's a major uh, base is being constructed for the nuclear submarines. So, so this is the, the second part. Now, when you look at the Chinese power and influence, you have to understand that the Chinese are a continental power. They have, they have a huge coastline starting from the north, coming up to the southwest nearly. But they are straddled, like I showed you, the first island chain in the east. And the South China Sea, and going beyond South China Sea is the Indian Ocean, which is, uh, which is by and large dominated by India. So now in this, the China has the only one narrow passages to break out its, uh, its maritime power from. And that passage is through the South China Sea. And there are four main straits, the, the Malacca, Sunda, uh, uh, Ombay Vitor, and the Lombok. Those are four straits for which the, America, the Chinese power can project it. So when we are looking at uh, the Chinese activities, when we're looking at either the Taiwan or we're looking at uh, the South China Sea or we're looking at the Chinese propensity to action act into the Indian Ocean, we are looking at China trying to adopt a breakout strategy which is central to China's future power projection plans. 
Oh, so, uh, so this is how the Indo-Pacific is is located. Now, the second issue which is now emerging is that the great game of geopolitical competition has begun in Asia. Now, this great game of geopolitical competition is primarily because incrementally, because of the strategic importance of the region, through grey zone tactics, directly trying to influence places, China is trying to extend its reach. First area of competition is Taiwan. We saw what happened yesterday, two days back. A large number of sorties, field firing, I mean, live firing going on. The message is very clear. Taiwan cannot afford its independence. And, and, and at some stage in the future, Taiwan will be integrated with the mainland China. The second area is the South China Sea. Now, Chinese are trying to make South China Sea as its own lake which they have by and large created because of the stupidity of the uh, Americans who saw this coming but did not do anything about it, the, the nine dash line, etc. And now the situation is this. Is the Chinese say, we are willing to discuss the code of conduct, but we will not discuss the code of conduct with ASEAN, the 10 nation states. No, we will discuss separately with each country with whom we have a territorial dispute. Now, that is where the whole point lies. And, and because uh, of their, their subsequent uh, developments on the reefs and, and creation of naval and maritime bases, they are now in the full control of South China Sea. So this is where the whole issue is coming about. Now we come to the Indian Ocean. In Indian Ocean, the Chinese are trying to create bases and spaces one is the Coco Island you must have heard recently. It's just 55 kilometers north of us. India has launched a protest. They are trying to build up a submarine base in, in, in Bangladesh, although things are not working out over there that well. And then we have uh, the uh, Guada, which is now intrinsically, it is being dredged right now as we speak to create it into a possible nuclear submarine base. And tomorrow, it could become also a place where the Shayong aircraft carrier battle group can also be located. And then going further, we have Djibouti, where, where the Chinese already have a base. And added to that, the dynamics that is taking place now in uh, uh, West Asia, where Chinese have brokered peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia. They have, uh, they have come closer to the, uh, to the West Asian powers. And therefore, now the Chinese footprint along with the Russian footprint is increasing in this, in this area and is resulting in uh, a, a de facto dominance of West Asia over the, in the erstwhile interests of the United States and its strategic partners. So there is a shift in the strategic equilibrium in the region that is taking place. So that's that's the that's the Indo-Pacific for you. Let me show you a map now to highlight how the how the cookie is crumbling in the Indo-Pacific. Now, I have used this map. Uh, I have used the red color uh, essentially as uh, area of the Sino-Russian cooperation. The pink signifies areas where which are not directly a part of the, the uh, Sino-Russian equations, but are dominated by their presence. And if you notice, I have put right up to this place over here, and, and this is where the Yemen is. And here, uh, even in Southeast Asia, if you know, notice, is now part and parcel, well, not part and parcel, but under a great degree of influence, not so much in terms of military influence, but in terms of supply chains, trade, commerce, and uh, manufacturing, uh, raw materials, etc. So, so when we're looking at uh, at the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, the locations of the United States are only in blue here, and in that, India, which is not a United States partner, and that's why I put it in green, 
is another outlier who is away from the influence of the Chinese. So when we are talking about an Indo-Pacific construct, we have to understand this, that there is a flimsy presence of the United States, which is now being converted into, as we go along, I'll explain that to you, how the United States is consolidating its power, and India. So when the Americans talk about Indo-US partnership, you have to see this map to see the influence that India can exercise, particularly from Malacca Strait, right up over here in this vast region that is central to maintaining peace and stability in the region. So if you have any more questions, I will... Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, so the interesting thing, I mean, the, the, when you look at the map, the the ocean fairing factor of, of any country is normally noted by the position of the country. And when we look at this particular map, we can see India jutting right out into the ocean. So there is, of course, a natural right of India to dominate the entire region. Now, when we talk about India and China first, before we get into the South China Sea and further, uh, further on uh, into the Pacific, okay. let's talk mm -hmm. about the Indian Ocean, sir. We've got the news of... Uh, the issue in uh, Cocoa Islands, we've got a news about this radar station coming up in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Chinese do keep, uh, and I'm going to use this word pretty uh, seriously, infiltrating into the Indian Ocean with their spy ships and stuff like that. Of course, there was a, another ship that was reported off the coast of, uh, not off the coast, but towards the direction of Orissa a couple of uh, months ago. What are the Chinese doing? I mean, of course, they can't bring in a huge force because... There are, there are certain deficiencies within the Chinese Navy as well. But when they do these forays into the Indian Oceans, so what kind of a strategic message are they trying to send to India? Or what kind? what is their purpose to do what they're trying to do, sir? Okay. In my earlier explanation, I gave you an understanding of the deployments. Can I have a map, please? Uh, uh, I gave you an understanding of the how the how the various power deployments are uh, in the region. Now, when you see uh, the Indian Ocean, Chinese have got a serious issue. As long as the Arctic route is not open, the entire seafaring trade, this bulk of the Chinese seafaring trade, bulk of the Chinese energy resources, bulk of the energy raw materials, which are coming from Africa, where they have invested a huge amount, are coming through the Indian Ocean. So this ocean is becoming, uh, is always has been uh, 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 central to the Chinese strategic thinking, whose control by any outside player will be inimical to their uh, uh, strategic interests. Having said that, why is China building one, two, three, four, five uh, carrier battle groups? The reason China is wanting to build this carrier battle group is Chinese realize that it's a long haul from, from any of the Shanghai port or any of the, of the ports to come and deploy it in the Indian Ocean. So they are planning over a period of time to station one or two carrier battle groups into this region, backed up by a couple of SSNs, that is nuclear powered submarines, and sometimes also deploy the SSBNs in the region. Now, <clears throat> for Indian, the 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 the, uh, the the second issue is, if you look at Gwadar, or, or you look at Cocoa Island or Myanmar, or the coast of Myanmar, from where it is developing land routes up to uh, the uh, Myanmar ports, and also into Gwadar. You see that if you deploy a DF-21 D missile systems over here with a range of 1200, uh, sorry, 1500 to 750 kilometers, the arc goes like this. So you can do not have to physically deploy the, uh, the, uh, the ships in the region, but you can also dominate this arc through long to medium range cruise missile and missile systems which are anti-ship ballistic missiles etc 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 plus if you can deploy uh, communication systems along the route 
you dominate this route through submarines through deployments through missiles so this is an area there is a fallacy in our mind that you have to have a physical presence no to the long range vectors backed up by credible isr can provide you that kind of support capability so from our perspective what we are trying to do is that we are placing about 8 to 10 deployments of our ships continuously 24 by 7 on stations all over the indian ocean as as part of our strategy to maintain surveillance over the key areas that's issue 1 issue 2 is we are upgrading our missile systems and other capabilities but that's that's only up to india so as far as china is concerned china is clear that india's intrinsic maritime capabilities are adequate for to regional defense to the maximum but they may not be adequate to deal with a preemptive chinese challenge which people like us who analyze these things believe we're going to come up any time after 26 2027 so we have got a period of about 4 to 5 years to to prepare for this challenge so this is how why the indian ocean becomes an important area and please also remember that this is indian ocean is our lifeline also for our, all our energy products added to that please note we are a 3.5 trillion dollar economy today but we will be 5 to 6 trillion dollar economy by 25 to 28 29 20 30 6 to 7 trillion economy majority of the global trade is by sea sir so as long as the majority of the global trade is by sea the domination and the security of the sea lines of communications are always in conflict and it is here and similarly is the the sea lines of communication going to southeast asia going to japan so when india talks about a security architecture in the region india talks about the fact is that hey guys japanese southeast asian indonesian etc all our lifelines are over here and if we allow the chinese to dominate them and dictate to them you know what will happen so therefore that is the intrinsicness the fear the importance and the need of closer collaboration the 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 just the factor that the chinese actually put up so much of effort in terms of uh, india in this particular sense tells us that uh, the the entire game in their minds is also changing uh, it was not that primarily focused towards india at, i would say about a decade ago but today we see the chinese of course talking about that uh, how significant is that as a as a change of thought process or a change of uh outlook for the chinese sir see uh, the important point is ki china looks upon the indian ocean as a primary area of its strategic interest and india for india to act we just discussed is in primary area of strategic interest therefore china is for china the continental threat is just a side issue in my view he he is fully aware that lsc is disputed he is putting pressure on us on lsc he is imposing political costs he is imposing economic costs he is imposing military costs but he knows that those costs are, are manageable by india is there but that's not what hurts india what will hurt india is that in case it lo- india loses its primacy in the indian ocean and 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 cannot protect its own sea lines of communication i'll give you an interesting story is that for two years back we were in discussion with the americans and we did a lot of exercising before the malabar came back into the to the western indian ocean uh, we we wrote a big paper and we said that it is imperative that the malabar exercises are not only held because if you recollect and uh, the uh, I, i think anthony was the the defense minister who had said no we don't want to excite the chinese by conducting malabar here we will do it in the south china uh, in the east china sea and the sea of japan etc but they we came, we said no we have to show the flag 
we have to show the flag of solidarity among strategic partners in the Indian Ocean region. And therefore, in 2021, there was a Malabar exercise which was done in Bay of Bengal. And the offshoot of that exercise was also done in the Western Indian Ocean. And, and, and in these, please also kindly note that these are not the exercises which took place with two ships or three ships. They were battle groups as well as nuclear submarines which were, which were also deployed. So the messaging was very clear that the intrinsically the bulwark of quadrilateral oriented Malabar oriented security architecture, although Malabar and quadrilateral are two different things, but basically you think that the, the, the essential imperative of a, a rule-based order at people who are looking at free and open Indo-Pacific uh, in which United States is a major player and its strategic partners uh, are, are, have the intrinsic capacity to be able to deploy. And today, as we are discussing, uh, there is a discourse in the United States of, of the recapitalizing the first fleet. They, they used to have a first fleet which was deployed in this region. They, they wrapped it up. And today, the Americans say we do not have the resources. They actually do not have the resources. But so, so, but we the talk. I mean, this is it's speculation. But the speculation is that India. I told you take ten years to build up capacities and capabilities to deal with this region. In that period, if some kind of an interim arrangement of security architecture that can be created in this region, that would help suffice and ensure the security and stability of the region. Because, the reason is because post-Ukraine war, the Americans are shifting their entire attention to Europe. And they have, they have moved away from uh, Indo-Pacific. Now an attempt is being made to re reassert themselves in Indo-Pacific. But that is, again, a long-term game before they can even start building up any worthwhile capabilities. So we have a window, like I said, four to five years. And that's the kind of window we need to exploit and build up adequate capabilities in terms of ISR, deployments, etc. Now we talk about this island in Carnico. We need to create a Carnico Bar base. A base, Carnico, base uh, uh, Air Force base in Carnico Bar has to come up priority. We need to locate Brahmos, long-range Brahmos, Brahmos with uh, hypersonic capabilities, the Brahmos uh, with uh, missile ranges, uh, with the uh, uh, pralay and other and those, and with the medium-range ballistic missiles, and also deploy our uh, Su-30s and Rafales. That's the only way you will ensure. Because please remember, the Chinese have LPDs which can carry about thousand people. And they can launch seaborne assault on small islands and capture them. We do not want to have a scenario where the Chinese can go and capture uh, uh, and any any territory or island in in uh, in, uh, in the Andaman Nicobar archipelago. So <clears throat> now I come to a, a little different picture: how the consolidation of power is taking place in Indo Pacific. A lot of people are not very clear on that. See. There are two aspects of this consolidation of power. We talked about how China is consolidating power. Consolidating its power through gray zone dynamics or uh, domination of South China Sea, trying to push pressure on this. But the United States is also doing a lot of things to come back as a player into the region. The first thing it is doing is re upping the cap his own capacities and capabilities in the region. Uh, through Pacific Defense Initiative plans. They're upgrading submarines, their submarine bases, etc. Incidentally, AUKUS base, AUKUS program, uh, has amongst itself, uh, apart from the nuclear submarines, a large amount of long-range capability being provided, including hypersonic weapons being provided to the Australians. Similarly, the Americans and, and the Japanese are entering into negotiations of are developing a common hypersonic uh, capability with ranges of 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers to be able to strike at, at, at targets 
deep inside. Uh, and third element is that they are trying to bring South Korea within the ambit. We've seen a break, a, a, a major breakthrough in which the South Koreans and the Japanese have given up their traditional hostility and they try to join hands together. And and today, South Korea has become the most dynamic ex arms export uh, uh, country in the world. So there, so this is all being done under the rubric of creating a ring of bases around China. And the, and the last but not the least is the four new bases coming up in Philippines. So now why Philippines is important? Please understand that. Philippines is, uh, between Taiwan and Philippines, there is a big strait. I keep forgetting its name. I will come back. That strait, if it is closed to the Chinese shipping, the PLA Navy is bottlenecked. PLA Navy can't break through. And if PLA Navy cannot break through, the only places it can break through then is Sunda, Lombok, or to the Malacca Strait. And if Indians, strong Indian positions along this thing is, the PLA Navy can be bottlenecked. Of course, this is a scenario in which, which will lead to a very high level of escalation. But we have seen that this is, this is the possibility that you have to play the psychology. You don't play with the scenario per se. You play with the psychology of the, of the other side. Hey, this can happen to you. So, and he only believes you once he sees your capability. So, if India new SSF, uh, N program develops uh, this thing and we have two SSNs uh, loitering around the, the Lombok or the Sundar and, and some strong deployments along the Malacca, you can set the message. So, this is how the game is played in the region. And, and the, at the, but we should have no doubts this thing is that China will use every muscle in its, in its system to break through this thing for which because it finds, finds itself as a constrained power. And India will have to do its best to ensure that India does not allow China the breakthrough that it requires. And therefore, as we see in 2023, we have to be focused up on the LC uh, line of actual control and Chinese forays over there. But we should also remember one thing. I'm not a Navy guy, but I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a strategic guy. So I, I see that the sh power shift taking place into the maritime domain and India has to suddenly up its ante in the maritime domain. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you're talking about the Luzon Strait, if I'm not mistaken, between Philippines and Taiwan. Okay. So so those, see, from uh, uh, Luzon Strait, yeah, absolutely. Yes. The, the travel time is five days from uh, Guam of entry of the American ships into that strait. So you have to, somebody has to hold the, these four bases that are coming up. People, uh, why suddenly four bases? You are, you, are, you are putting up those four bases to ensure that the, the Luzon Straits are not uh, exploited by the Chinese. And and they and they don't take over, they control over these. So 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 when when you look at the Chinese paraphernalia in terms of LSDs and other elements, you, there would be an amphibious assault taking place on these issues if the, if the push comes to shove. Because Chinese will deny these to the Americans. Because if they deny these to the Americans, then they isolate the entire South China Sea uh, from the bulwark of the American uh, uh, deployments in the East Asia. So these are the something which, which, uh, which as strategists we need to look at and understand. And similarly for us, Malacca Strait control is the next best. We have to control Malacca Strait. And Malacca Strait will be, will be uh, uh, we, we have, should have no doubts that when push comes to shove, we will find the Chinese SSNs floating around in the South, China, South Indian Ocean and coming into the support of their uh, people. So this is how the cookie is going to crumble in this region. So let's move a little towards the east. Uh, China, of course, finds itself, as you said, as a constrained power, which is very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, let me say that we've been talking about China for a while, for about two years in the, on this particular channel, that you're the first person who's actually said that. Uh, those two words put together. Constrained power is an interesting thing, which also brings about a sense of 
uh, frustration. Is that what we are seeing in terms of the live firing, you know, exercise in Taiwan? That every time that this is becoming, uh, is China normalizing a display of frustration in the Taiwan Straits? Let me ask you this. Uh, the bottom line is uh, China believes that Taiwan cannot be allowed to break away. A, China has to have an access and control over Taiwan, whether physical or not so physical. China believes that it has the time at its disposal. It doesn't want to do things in a hurry. But it believes that by rather than doing a military action, if it can undermine the, the fence sitters in, in Taiwan and bring them onto their side, it can, it can be a much better strategy than fighting for it. Uh, somewhere down the line, uh, the line will have to be crossed depending upon how the commanders of the, at the Central Military Commission or the the northern, eastern, or the or the southern uh, naval commands of the Chinese Navy look at the whole picture, and uh, and the and the relativity of power balance they believe with uh, with the United States and its allies, uh, because if Taiwan is integrated, or even if Taiwan is isolated, then that allows China to project power deep into the Pacific. And we'll get back to the scenario when the Japanese attack the Pearl Harbor. You know, I mean, because there was no deployment. There was no, nothing in, in between. So, so for, the, for the West, for the United States-led alliance system, first island chain is the most critical element of their defense lines. And Chinese understand that. But Chinese have a problem. The Chinese problem is the Taiwan here abuts the show window of the Chinese Han civilization. And, and if there is a war on, his show window is the first to get attacked. I mean, China can't afford Beijing, Shanghai, and uh, Guangzhou and others, uh, Xi'an, being attacked in the first wave of attacks. Yeah. It's like, so, so it upgrades the escalation. So and that escalation is going, I'll, I'll knock off New York and then bullshit like that. But the question at the end of the day is this, is how does China play this game? I have done a lot of war gaming with my, my American friends on this issue. And I keep telling them that China will, if at all it undertakes strikes, it will work on two issues. Psychological undermining of the of large scale population through, through attempted influence operations, selective breaching of, of the zones and deploying actual forces and building up on slow and steady basis, and then taking control of some key air bases, et cetera, et cetera. And, and like they say, cabbage peeling strategy, start pulling out from there into the areas, because it's not a big place to capture. But it's going to be a long process, long haul process. Uh, in that, how, what is the reading? And, and more than reading, what is the stomach of the Western past to deal with this kind of a scenario where, again, there's an interesting facet, people don't look at it. The entire zone of supply chain of the Chinese is next door, 100 kilometers away, whereas the zone of supply chains of these gentlemen is very 500,000 kilometers away. So they are operating for, from extended lines, they are operating from interior lines. So this is what how, how the whole thing has to be seen. So therefore, Taiwan issue is a very complex issue. It's not a simple issue. People just take it, ke, oh, attack kar dega Taiwan ko ji. Taiwan ko attack karna itna asaan nahi hai, uske liye bhi. Aur Americans ko usko defend karna itna asaan nahi hai. And then, there is an interesting strategy he's putting in place, which we are also tending to overlook. He is using North Korea as a fingering uh, unit. He's keep fingering Japan. 
trading or shock and awe in south korea south korea is a developing nation they have worked their asses off to create this aura of of or development how 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 uh, how do you expect south korea i mean you have to go to the, i've been to the dmz incidentally i've seen, i've been there so i see how 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 this whole game is it's shocking huh? there are there are well, i must be about 26000 or 40000 uh, uh, this caves where the artillery is located how do you knock off those artillery which is firing from the caves yeah? and missile sites and things like that on, on south korea so 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 this and then next to it within the range is japan now what is the intrinsic capacity of japan to withstand this whole pressure and how much will the americans support them so at some stage the nuclear deterrence has to kick in and in the kicking in of nuclear deterrence it is one deterrence against two deterrences north korea and china here yeah? please understand so this is how uh, between east between the east and us we are much better place at least in the continental space to deal with china i do not believe in in by in people who say that china are asserting too much yes they are asserting they coming into our area etc etc that's all that's that's the shadow boxing but if we can build up a strong coalition in the in the indian ocean region and deny this region to the chinese we will be we will be strangulating their critical slugs from where his entire resources operate and now that's why sir if you notice one of the mongolian pipelines was the key area of discussion between uh, mr xi jinping and mr putin from far east so i think i'll stop here when no more questions i can answer as a matter of fact i have one more sir which is yeah, now sure. we 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 we've seen the indian ocean we've seen the south china sea i want to move you know you mentioned something really interesting about north korea i wish i could uh, that's a whole episode itself by the way and i i'd like to kind of you know there 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 are two fake arms of china where he tries to create trouble one is pakistan and the second one being north korea i'll i'll take that up with you as a uh, as a separate discussion uh, but let's let's move over to the sea of japan where north korea does create trouble and the sea of japan where there is so uh, the 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 senkaku right? yes senkaku the, island yes the senkaku and the northern thread from russia china combination which which is yeah. much spoken about today uh is it a combination threat or is it you know something that the chinese would like to project especially in the northern seas see uh, I, i mean uh, if you notice in september last year or something like that the russian and the chinese did a major exercise in that region Uh, north koreans did not take part in this please note they did not take part in it but it, they they did an exercise in that region uh, the whole idea and if you if you look at the new chinese uh, russian uh, maritime strategy the the number one area of their interest is the arctic sea and second is the indo pacific exactly the same region that's the number two area they're not looking at the black sea and all that as important area look at this is the area so what they are trying to do is telling the west or the or, or the or the nato alliance or, or the or the western alliance system is that we can open one more front against you i mean you're looking at china dealing with china from the east you're looking at north korea but we can also open a maritime front behind you and we can come behind you and and to uh, to uh, and we have and again please also note that this is something people don't look at it the map geography geography all the bases from which they operate after all uh, north korea was controlled by russia if you read like you know 30 to parallel so all the bases bloody was to get all the all all the bases are within their zone of influence you know so if they, if they so they uh, so they can stage 
any number of the stuplobs and, and long range missile systems and now the new torpedoes with two two megaton <laughs> weapons to, to, to. so so you know i mean there is a lobby this afternoon we were having the same debate there is a lobby in our in our mind i mean in in our country which does not look at a larger picture uh, of possibility of use of massive resources in in uh, executing operational or strategic plans uh, the 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 logic behind russia trying to propagate uh, the the availability of across the board nuclear deterrence is this only is there that please understand there is a limits to escalation please understand you can play the game up to a point and after that point breaks down when the deterrence breaks down then all bets are off so here again the problem with the united states is this that it is the only nuclear power everybody is on extended deterrence chinese are building up the n- nuclear capacities they are building a huge number of silos they are having a space based systems they are having hypersonic uh, nuclear weapons russia even better than them how are you going to handle this so you know so, so the dilemma for a country like india is this how do we respond to these challenges because we are intrinsically there is a very interesting paper which has come out today is called the 25 transitional states who who are maintaining the neutrality which of, of which we are a leading player in that in those states so in this in our transactional aspects we have to do a lot of balancing and that balancing is something which is going to be a very very critical aspects going forward for us and it has to be a political balancing it has to be a diplomatic balancing it has to be a strategic balancing it will have to be a military balancing something we are fixation on on the land borders does not allow us to look at it from that perspective because if you do not look at it from that perspective the vectors you develop the capacity you develop the capabilities you develop asymmetric capabilities you develop will be that much less than what you would need in a conflict scenario in the future uh may i request the name of the paper sir once again uh it's okay just i just tell you just can i just take a second to just see absolutely this something like that is really interesting because uh, you know you've got a uh uh what you what you've spoken about is a basically a dual front sort of a scenario and that's something that we saw with uh uh the, the chinese trying to do and of course uh is called the how to survive a superpower split is on economic economist of today i'll send it to you i i i subscribe to economist so i'll send fantastic. it to you fantastic fantastic sir i'm sure the the listeners the viewers of the show would also love to uh, see that that's why i'm actually wanting to see that uh, guys you can actually see this uh, so this is of course been very educational in terms of uh, this thing the power dynamics surely are changing and especially you mentioned in the in one of your answers that the ukraine war has brought in a whole different dynamic as far as uh, security in the region is concerned because a lot of people are now asking questions with regard to the capacity of especially the us to you know live up to its promise if i may just say that loosely but sir let me just say this uh, for the first interaction this has been wonderful uh, it's 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 a great learning experience as i said i'd like to get you back with regards to talking about the two chinese proxies uh, i i was not able to <laughs> fit, fit the word at that time but i've called it now the two chinese proxies that it uses to create trouble around the world as a next conversation but till then sir thank, thank you. you sir once again enjoy thank it. you enjoy enjoy being on the show thank you